So for about the last week of school, you're going to be learning about how living things are classified. Like oftentimes we tend to categorize things, um, whether in your cupboards you tend to organize like pasta on one shelf and breads on the bottom shelf. You tend to organize things a certain way. Well, scientists have figured out a way to classify and order all the different types of living things. So some of the things you can think about, like different groups of like, for example, animals versus plants. And then if you're talking about animals exclusively, how do we sometimes categorize animals? Sometimes we categorize them as the reptiles and sometimes we categorize them as amphibians or bears and things like that. So scientists had to develop some kind of method for being able to classify and order animals so that we can tell the difference between them. All right, so there are seven life processes um, and the reason why this picture of this lady is here is because her name is Mrs. Gren and we use the uh, the word Mrs. Gren to help us remember what the seven life processes are. So the seven life processes are basically that all living things do all of these. So if you're a living thing, you must do these seven things. So Mrs. Gren would be the mnemonic for movement. So you have to move if you're a living thing. Uh, you have to respire or breathe. You have to be sensitive to certain stimuli, whether it's like light, like you react to light, or you react to touch or things like that. Uh, you have to grow. You have to reproduce. You have to excrete waste. Uh, and you have to eat or undergo some type of nutritive process. So all living things do these seven processes. You'll watch that in class. Okay, so of all the living things that exist, we are able to break them up into basically two or three groups. So the three domain way of classifying all living things, so this is the, th the method of three domains. Uh, the three domains are RK bacteria, and RK means old, so old bacteria, U bacteria, which means true bacteria, and then the eukaryotes, eukaryota. So all living things on earth fit into one of these three groups. These are considered to be domains. Now sometimes, uh, actually just lately, they differentiated between archaebacteria and eubacteria as being two different domains. They used to group them all together and call them the monorans. So before what they did was they said there's the monorans and there's the eukaryotes. Now they say you're either an archaeobacteria, a eubacteria, or a eukaryote. So you belong to one of the three domains. So it's just recently that they split the monorans into these two groups. So if I say the word monoran, I'm, it means that I'm talking about bacteria, okay? Either archaeobacteria or eubacteria. Now monorans, monorans are prokaryotic, which means they don't have a nucleus, and they're unicellular, which means they're made of one cell. Okay, so if you think of what a bacteria looks like, such as uh, this picture right here, these bacteria, they're unicellular, okay, so there's single cells here, each one is a separate bacteria, and each cell has no nucleus, okay, so archaeobacteria and eubacteria, they're both prokaryotic and they're both unicellular. Okay, now the difference between archaeobacteria and eubacteria is that archaeobacteria tend to exist in very extreme environments, whether it's very hot or very cold, and new bacteria or everything else, they're considered the more modern bacteria. Now, eukaryotes, they have a true nucleus, okay? So, monorans, these bacteria, okay, they're prokaryotic, and they're unicellular. They have no nucleus, and they're made of one cell. Eukaryotes, like us, they have a nucleus, with organelles inside of them. Okay, so if you can think of the cell as having many organelles inside or having a nucleus, it's a eukaryote. Now, of course, there's other ways to classify all living things. Instead of using three domains and saying that all living things live in one of those three domains, you would say that um, they live in one of the six kingdoms. So this is the six kingdom way of describing all living things. Okay, so the first group would be archaeobacteria. The second group would be eubacteria. 
Okay, so in the last model that we saw, these were two different groups as well. Okay, so archaeobacteria and eubacteria. They're prokaryotic, they're single-celled, and they're either, either auto or heterotrophic. That means that they either make their own food, they're autotrophs, or they're heterotrophs and they need to ingest something to make their food. So either make their food or ingest something to, make, to get energy. Okay, that's what archaeobacteria and eubacteria do. These are their characteristics. Okay, now if you can remember from the last grouping that we were just looking at, this one right here, the eukaryotes are everything that's not a monarin. So you're either an archaeobacteria or a eubacteria, and if you're neither of those, you're a eukaryote, like us. Okay, so all the eukaryotes have been further broken down into more groups. So here's the two monarin groups. Then all the eukaryotes are broken down into either protists, fungi, plants, or animals. Okay, animals aren't on this slide. Oh, they're there. Okay, plants or animals. So if you're a monarin, you're made of one cell. If you're a eukaryote, you can be made of more than one cell, or you can be made of one cell. Okay, so groups three, four, five, and six are all eukaryotes. So protists, these are eukaryotic, which means they have a nucleus. They can be auto or heterotrophic, which means they can either make their own food or have to obtain it some other way. And they're single-celled. So protists are all single-celled. Here's an example of a protist. So this is a living organism because it does all those seven life processes that we just mentioned with Mrs. Gren. Okay, it moves. Um, it respires and it's sensitive and so on. So it does all those things. So it's a living thing. So this organism, which doesn't look like much, looks like a bit of spit actually. This is a protist. Okay. It has a nucleus. It eats food. It ingests food to get energy and it's made of one cell. Okay. This is called an amoeba. Fungi like mushrooms. They're eukaryotic, which means their cells have nuclei. They're heterotrophic, which means they need to ingest something to get their energy. They're not like plants that make their own energy. They have to eat it somehow. And they're multicellular. They're made of more than one cell. So even looking at a picture of fungi, okay, these are shelf mushrooms. They're ones that grow on the sides of trees. These guys here, they need to absorb their nutrients. So they usually get it from decaying matter. So when matter tends to break down, uh, mushrooms will absorb, a fungi will absorb the nutrients. So they don't make their own food. They don't use light to make their food. They have to absorb it so they're heterotrophic and they're made of more than one cell. Okay, so these are fungi. Now plants. Plants are eukaryotic, which means that they have a nucleus. They're autotrophic, which means that they make their own food. Okay, and they're also, also multicellular. So it's made of more than one cell. And we know that because we've looked at plants under the microscope and they have more than one cell when we look at them under the microscope. And then lastly, we have animals. So if you think about yourself as an animal, our cells have nuclei. We have to ingest food in order to get energy and we're made of more than one cell, okay? So again, groups six, five, four, and three on this sheet, they're all known as eukaryotes, which means that they have a nucleus. Okay, the bacteria up here, the archaeobacteria and the eubacteria, they don't have a nucleus, so they're prokaryotic. Okay, so some eukaryotes are like bacteria and that they have one uh, cell. Okay, so protists, this guy right here, he has a nucleus, which makes him a eukaryote, but he's only made of one cell, like bacteria. Okay, you will be responsible for knowing these characteristics. So if I give you some of the characteristics, I may ask you what kingdom I, do I belong to? Okay, so it can either be, you can either be part of, of the six kingdom system or you can be part of the three domain system. All right, so there was a guy named uh, Carolus Linnaeus uh, and he's responsible for beginning the whole process of classifying animals based on their names and their characteristics. So, uh, Carol, 
Carolus Linnaeus, or Carl Linnaeus, um, he invented the modern-day taxonomy, which is the way that we classify organisms, with its use of seven taxa. So here are the seven taxa listed in like an upside-down triangle, representing that the topmost taxa is the most encompassing, it's the biggest, and then it gets narrowed down. Okay, and they use pictures to show examples of how it works. So for example, kingdom animalia. Okay, so the kingdom animalia, we just talked about the six kingdoms, so if we talk specifically about kingdom animalia, uh, all of these pictures here, these are all animals that belong to kingdom animalia. Now, if you go a step down and get a little bit more specific and talk about chordates, phylum chordata, those are animals that have, um, at one time, they had a hollow notochord, that's what they get the term chordate, and your notochord turns into your spinal column. So all of these organisms here, when they're developing in the womb, they have a notochord. So that's why they're called chordates. Now if you go get even more specific and you talk about mammals, mammals are animals that feed off of their uh, mother's milk uh, and they all have fur. Okay, that would exclude the snake here. So all of these guys here, they're animals, they're chordates, and they're mammals. Okay, the snake is not a mammal. He's a reptile. Now you get even more specific, you get into orders. Okay, so animals that eat uh, meat, and predominantly meat, they're called carnivores. So we take the squirrel out of the equation here. So it's getting even more exclusive. So all these animals here, they're animals, they're chordates, they're mammals, but they're also carnivores. Further down, you say ursidae. Ursidae are big animals with uh, fur that tend to have small ears, so we know them as bears. Genus ursus, okay, that's getting even more specific, so certain types of bears. And then when you're talking exclusively about a certain type of species, you get two names. So this type of bear here is called ursus arctos.